This is Party Wall Pro, the podcast where surveyors tell you how they first started and how they've grown their business, making it easier for you to get to the top. Hi, hi, and welcome to another edition of this uh, podcast, the Party Wall Pro podcast. I've got uh, Rob French with me today from uh, Delva Patman Redler. He's um, an equity partner there. And um, he's here to talk to us about basements. Um, so, Rob, tell me about this exciting, well, the excitement behind basements. You know, you, you hear all, all the time these basements in, uh, in Mayfair and stuff, these crazy things that are being dug out. And, um, and you've, um, so you've prepared a presentation that uh, you've given at the London branch of the P&T Club. And I think you're going, going on tour over the next few months. Um, and so uh, I'm quite excited to hear about this because it's uh, it's obviously a subject matter that that, that people are are interested in. So um, I think this time it's going to be more kind of lecture style because of course you've got your your material, um, you've got your slides that hopefully we'll be able to put into um, the um, with the the podcast. So um, so I'll leave the, the the floor to you, Rob. Thanks, sir. Um, yeah, so we basements are obviously we've all been doing basements for quite a while. Um, but now we've got a, a new situation where, because we've done so many basements, we're doing basements now next to basements. Um, so basements next to basements brings in a new set of skills and a new set of sort of legal implications and um, you know, possibilities for dispute um, that we're now dealing with more and more. So this this presentation goes through you know the standard issues with basements, but also a lot of the intricacies that that where we deal with you know, basements adjoining um, existing basements. Um, so the, what I've done, I've tried to split this into um, basically the, the, the key issues that, that I've come across and, and also the, the issues that I foresee, you know, will play out in the future. Um, so some of this is, is based on issues I have dealt with and some is, is purely just speculation of, of what I feel um, further court cases might be. Um, so the, the first issue is um, enclosure costs um, with um, trimming over spill and trespass. The situation here is that where we agree an award, where there's a where there's a basement already done to one side, um, and then the adjoining owner wants to excavate their own basement, within that award there'll be enclosure costs under Section 1111 of the Act. So they'll usually be agreed by the surveyors up front and included in the award. And then, when the when the the who used to be the adjoining owner now the building owner excavates down, they find that the that the the underpins have extended further into their property than what they expected, um, either due to poor back shuttering, um, you know, concrete concrete um, concrete overspill. There's, there's various reasons, um, but they then find themselves faced with having to trim those underpins, um, or obviously set back the wall to their basement. Um, usually they'll opt for trimming because in the areas where basements are undertaken, obviously the floor area is is, is key. Um, what the building owner, um, the one now undertaking the works, usually likes to do is suggest that there's a set-off that takes place between the costs of um, tri you know, trimming the overspill um, against the Section 1111 costs agreed. But problems start to arise where technically and legally you can't actually do that because there's no right of set-off. As, as soon as the enclosure is made on the, on the, new, on the underpins, um, the, the monies are owed. So the, the adjoining owner can enforce the award to achieve those payments. Um, so trying to explain this to the, to the building owner, you know, that they have to pay out even when they're at loss due to trimming um, is, is, is quite difficult. There's another of other issues as well that go along with this. Um, and that is that the, the, the now building owner assumes that the tribunal of surveyors can deal with the costs, but actually they can't. Um, under the Act, Section 2.2, 2, we, can, we can obviously, the surveyors can give the rights to trim this trespass, um, but there's no mechani mechanism to award those costs against the, um, the adjoining owner. Um, so the only way that you can actually claim costs is to go back to the original tribunal surveyors that actually installed um, the underpins, or well, sorry, they didn't install it, but the 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 people that actually awarded for the underpins to be to be cast. Um, 
tracking down that tribunal could be difficult. Yeah. Uh, and even if you do track them down, um, you've actually then you've actually then got to convince the owner at that time, cons- you know, considering if they might have sold the property on, um, that they're liable for those for those um, costs. And obviously, you've got to convince them to pay um, without you know having to go um, to go legal and take them to court. So there's a, there's another a, a number of problems. That that last issue um, is it, a very old case. It goes back to Selby and Whitbread, um, where um, that that set the precedence that um, the obligations under an award um, say with the original owner that undertook the the works, um, but the benefits um, get passed on with 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 Sal. So as as paying out for the cost to trimming um, is a, is an obligation that that you know it's, it needs it needs to be probably tested in court and a, and a solicitor's opinion would would be would be beneficial. Um, but my understanding is is that the obligations stay with the original building owner, so you, you may have to pat them down. But so so uh, sorry, so Rob, so what's your obligation as as the the surveyor um, to find? The original building owner, who's now the adjoining owner, to get to get your hands on, yeah, to, because Wait, it, it, it is. If you remember, I imagine it can be difficult. Tribunal. Sorry, go on. I imagine it can be difficult, right? Yeah, tracking well, tracking down the original tribunal. Yeah. Because we all, all so that yeah, we all sort of uh, um, usually uh, know each other. Um, that it's, it's usually uh, fairly easy to track down the original tribunal surveyors. But tracking down the original building owner is, is likely to be very difficult mm. because there's no real mechanism to to find them once they've once they've sold a property and moved on. So it can be it can be really difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, the the only other possibility is to um, is to find out who the contractor was that understood the works, um, and if you can prove that they've deviated from the um, from the specification, um, then technically you you could potentially go after them for. Um, um, yeah, for, for basically for, for nuisance um, and, and negligence of, of, of going outside of their, or well, potentially not negligence, but um, you know it's, it's their fault that the trespass has occurred if they haven't followed the um, what the details in the award and the method statements. Yeah. So I have seen a contractor successfully sued once for um, for for trespass. Yeah. The, the the other issue as well is the is the limitations um, period. I think a lot of Surveyors make the mistake of thinking that if the basement was done either six or twelve years previously, um, then then basically the right to claim for trespass has expired because of the limitations period. Um, but we've actually I had a, a job where we actually got council's opinion, um, and the opinion was that the limitations period starts um, when the trespass is discovered. So I don't think that's ever really uh, a valid consideration that, that the right sort of um, yeah. would have expired. So, so in this situation, uh, the best thing to do first off is to check the original award. Um, if you can't find the award, um, if, well, if, you, if you believe there wasn't ever any award um, for the for the underpins, which is you know unfortunately sometimes um, does happen, um, or if you know there was an award but no one's got a copy, so you can't find it, um, then your only remedy is unfortunately common law. So you you can't deal with this under the Act at all. Um, if you if you can find the award, the first thing to do is to check the actual underpinning details to make sure that what you're suggesting, or sorry, what your what your appointing owner is suggesting is a trespass is actually a trespass under the award, because we see many awards where the the underpins are eccentrically loaded, um, so basically they're you know they're in line with the the the, the party that understood the basement. The underpins are in line with their face of the party wall, um, but then they've, you know, they've they basically the award shows that the the, found the underpins then go out to the end of the core wall on the adjoining owner's side. So when that adjoining owner then becomes the building owner and digs down, they're they're likely to be upset that they've got a lot of concrete you know, coming all the way out to the end of the core walls into their land. But if the award originally permitted that, then yeah, there's there's no remedy. There's no there's no basically recourse against the, the details in the award because that was awarded. Then there may be a claim for ultra ultra varies um, that the surveyors didn't have the jurisdiction to award that you know that trespass. Um, but again, that would be a you know that would be an, a, uh, an appeal ultra varies of an award. It wouldn't be something the surveyors can resolve. Yeah. 
Um, so as to sort of practical advice of moving this issue forward, the best thing to do is to explain to the parties just, you know, how complicated this is um, and how, you know, it, it, it might not be adequately resolved under the under the Act um, if you can't find the original tribunals or the original building owner. Um, and so explaining the complications and suggesting that they uh, they basically work together um, to agree a, a set-off payment against, you know, the, the costs of the 11-11 enclosure costs um, set off against the... Um, the cost of the trimming, and as long as both parties are reasonable and they agree a reasonable cost for trimming, there's no reason why they can't, with an exchange of letters, you know, a, a, agree uh, a, suitable, a, a suitable amount to be paid, um, taking consideration of the of the trimming. Um, and then, if the original building owner wants to then track down their contractor and make a claim against them, then you know, then so be it. But um, if they can make that agreement, um, then the payments can be made and, and hopefully the issue is, is put to rest. How likely is this to happen? It's, it's very common. Um, yeah, I think it's... Because when a contractor excavates down, um, they're digging underneath the party wall and I haven't actually got sight of the, you know, of the adjoining owner's face of that party wall. So they're purely just going off measurements as to where they, how far they feel they need to dig under. So if, if the awards, which they should quite rightly say, is that the, the foundation should be in line with the adjoining owner's face at the party wall, they're, they're digging under blind to try and find where that, that face of the adjoining owner's wall is. Yeah. Um, and then contractors used to, from my experience, be quite bad um, with either back shuttering or um, you know, casting the rear face of the, the underpin bay straight. Mm -hmm. So it, it's very common to find um, overspill. So it's going to be a common occurrence then? Uh, uh, it, it's going to be very common, yeah. And, and how likely is it that the, um, the building owner and the adjoining owner agree on setting off these costs? Have you, have, you, have you seen it before by letter saying, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pay. Okay, consider, yeah, we're, we're in Mayfair, so maybe <laughs> it's easier, but still. Yeah, it's difficult because I think... Um, as we all probably know as surveyors, um, for some reason, neighbours do like to fall out. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, you know, it would, it would seem obvious to everyone that a reasonable approach, agreeing a reasonable cost for the trimming, um, and then, you know, putting that against the set-off, it would seem very sensible. Um, and, you know, I have seen it a lot of times resolved in that way, but then I've also seen a lot of the time, you know, it, it go legal because the owners just purely cannot agree. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, unfortunately, it is it is a common it is a common dispute. Yeah. Sorry, I said I was not going to going to cut in. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> no problem at all. So, that, I mean, that's that's the first issue. Um, the second issue is security for expenses. One I'm sure that we're all fairly familiar with. Um, and yeah, the, the, the common issues under security for expenses are what can you hold it for, um, and how much is reasonable to hold. Um, I think all surveyors agree that the, that the main purpose of security for expenses is to protect against abandonment of the works, um, to, to then you know, backfill the basement, or um, some surveyors believe it's to finish the underpins, you know, just to make safe um, where, the, where the developer unfortunately abandons the works. So I think everyone agrees that. Um, not everyone agrees that you can hold it for um, repairs to the adjoining owner's property. Uh, my view is that if there's a reasonable risk that damage could be caused to the adjoining owner's property, um, then it is reasonable to hold a, um, a suitable sum in, in security. Um, the status of the building owner is obviously a big consideration as well. Um, if there are, if it's a joint venture or an offshore company that could um, potentially you know, fold overnight, um, then I think it's entirely reasonable to have um, potentially a larger security for a expensive sum to to protect against um, abandonment and again if there's a risk of damage then um, if there's damage caused and then the, um, the, the building owner disappears then obviously there is a, a legitimate loss there so I think a reasonable sum um, in those circumstances is, um, is, is beneficial. Um, level of risk as well is obviously a, another big consideration. We're talking about basements here so basements pose the, the largest risk 
to an adjoining owner's property and would have fallen out of all of the, the works under the Act. Um, and so, again, with basements, it's going to be where you're, you're going to find security for expenses most, most commonly requested um, and probably achieving the, the higher sums. Another, uh, another item that's always disputed is release terms. Um, I've heard a lot of um, surveyors say that the security sum should be held for a long period of time, even after the basin box and the, the lateral restraint is, is completed. Um, I've, had a, I've had many different engineers confirm that it's unlikely that there will be any more movement after the, the main basement box and natural restraint is installed. So my view is that holding, you know, for, for a year, I've heard even 18 months after the basement box is complete, I don't think it's reasonable. I think the lion's share of the security for expenses should be released um, once the basement box is in. Um, how the security is held is, is another issue. Um, there are now insurances on the market. Um, I, I actually worked with a, an insurance broker um, to develop a, an insurance policy. And that, this, the first thing I said when I met with the, uh, the broker was that the policy won't work unless it pays out um, when, this, when the surveyor's uh, making a ward. And he reassured me that that was, in essence, the crux of the, the policy was that it pays out instantly on the surveyors making a compensation award. So the the policy, I believe, works, and I think it, it is starting to be used more and more now. It commonly costs between 1% and 1 to 3% the cost of the, the security agreed, um, and it is, you know, it's, it's a good policy. Um, the other way is, is escrow company. Um, security for Expenses Limited, you know, is one. Um, and again, yeah, they, 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 they're very good, they're very cost effective um, and usually building owners are happy to put the monies into those accounts. I think if it's very large sums, um, then the, the security of, of that account probably needs, need, needs to be checked, but um, I've never had a problem using it and it seems to be a, you know, a very good process. Yeah, because security um, for expenses limited, that's, um, that's regulated by the FCA as well, right? so you've got that. It, it is, yeah. It has to be, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I've never really looked into it because I've never placed um, any, you know, real substantial um, sums into it, um, or sorry, awarded for any substantial sums to be paid in. Um, but I, I guess the event of, you know, that that account being hit with um, fraud or, um, you know, anything like that, I guess that needs to be looked into. Um, and, uh, and at some point, I'm sure a building owner will look into that to reassure themselves that their money is, is safe in that account. Mm. Um, I, did have, I did have one uh, adjoining owner um, place half a million into security um, and, and they done some checks and they were more than happy that, that, that the, the process worked with security for expenses limited. So, yeah, yeah it, it seems to be a very good process. But I think we should, I think the point here I'm trying to make is we should, we, we should recommend that the building owner undertakes their own checks um, so that they're happy with putting money in there, really to protect ourselves. Um, the other way that you can hold it is bank account as well, is ring fence in the bank account. I have seen that done, and it again seems to work very well. The bank account is authorised not to release the funds unless it's in, in line with the terms of the award. Um, that depends on the bank and whether the bank is willing to, um, to operate that process. Um, solicitors used to hold security, but not so much anymore following the, the money laundering um, laws. Uh, so I don't think solicitors now are, are, are really too keen to hold security sums. Um, and so practical advice on security for expenses is to educate the building owner that yeah, even if they're placing money into an escrow account, it's still their money um, and they would have to pay that out. Yeah, if, they, if they cause damage to the adjoining owner's property, they're still going to have to pay for that damage, whether it's you know out of the uh, out of the security account or whether it's out of their own account. So they're not they're not at any greater risk of having to pay out for compensation. You know, if the money is held in in, in security, um, so they still got the, they've still got the same level of risk. And, and now with the the insurance policies, is yeah, they might find a way that they can provide security for a reasonable sum without it actually having to lock up that money. So they, they should really consider it. Um, it also reassures the adjoining owner that there is that money available, you know, that the that the, the scheme is well funded um, and there is that ability to make safe their property 
um, or make good repairs if damage is caused. So it, it can help relations as well. Yeah. And obviously, if it's a if it's a reasonable request for security, ultimately, even if it goes to the third surveyor, it's still it's going to have to be agreed. So the the more and more the building owner resists it and tries to tries to fight it, it's just going to cost them more money in fees. So sometimes the best thing to do, if it's a reasonable request, is just agree it um, and you know agree a way to hold it in in in, um, in escrow or an insurance policy as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. And so that I think that's the practical approach really is just to explain it in detail to the um, to the building owner. Mm-hmm. The other issue is when the adjoining owner requests ridiculously huge sums, you know they need to be educated to say, well, it it doesn't cover the worst case scenario. It's just there for abandonment and, um, you know, potentially a, a small amount towards potential repairs. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've seen some, you know, huge, huge requests for security, yeah, which would just make, you know, I mean, if, if everyone had to pay these huge sums into into escrow every time they wanted to undertake a development, we, you know, we we'd make development unfeasible. So, you know, it's not. It's, we need to we need to be sensible with it. Mm-hmm. Um, the next issue is um, is reinstatement um, and diminution in value. Um, this issue um, basically came to everyone's attention in the case of Lee Valley Developments um, and Derbyshire. Um, what what happened was there was a um, a buy to let property um, owned by the adjoining owner. Um, the building owner um, obtained an award to excavate adjacent to um, that buy to let property, where there was four flats, I think, four individual flats within the the one property. Um, the excavation, unfortunately, with the excavations, the um, the building owner's property slipped slightly into the excavation. Sorry, the adjoining owner's property slipped slightly into the excavation and caused so much damage that all of the tenants had to move out. And the only real um, remedy was to rebuild the property. Um, so you know, very substantial. So the 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 difference between um, rebuilding um, and just the the Diminution in value of the of the site as a um, you know, the value of the site as a development project um, was was huge. So the adjoining owner was claiming, sorry, the adjoining owner surveyor was claiming for um, for rebuilding, um, and the building owner surveyor was was claiming that it should just be a calculation of diminution in value. Um, th- that wasn't the actual point that was decided in court. Um, what was decided in court was actually the right of the surveyors to and the third surveyor um, to make a determination on that point. The court case decided that the surveyors did have the right to make that point, um, and so it went to the third surveyor. Um, and the third surveyor decided um, that the the actual true um, and proper means of calculating the the loss um, was to it was a diminution in value plus the costs required. Um, to put the building owner back in the position that they were in when they had a, um, you know, a, a buy-to-let property with all flats rented out um, in good condition. So it was it was almost like a diminution value plus calculation, mm. and what that that closed the gap between um, rebuilding and diminution value closed it down enough that that the first surveyor's award wasn't appealed. But inevitably, there there is going to be a point where. There's such a big gap, even with the diminution value plus exercise, that he's going to be still worth taking that to call. So, so I think we are we are going to see this this issue arise again, um, and likely probably tested in the courts. Um, the, I think the only reason why the diminution value argument was considered um, was because it was a buy to let property, so it was an investment property. I think where it's I think all surveyors would probably agree where it's a residential property. Um, it's you, you, you can't argue that it's diminution value because it's you know it's, it might be a family home or you, you know you can't you can't use that process. The only the only exception to that rule was the case of Brewer v Lecker Corby, um, and in this case the adjoining owner uh, basically admitted that she was going to sell the property, um, and therefore the building owner quite rightly said, well your loss is, dim- is only diminution value then because at the point of sale. Um, you know, it's only your, the reduction in the value of the property. Um, my understanding is is that um, Lecker Corvey then fouled um, on appeal of that award, um, basically because um, it could be proven that she was definitely selling. So I think she she said, "Oh, actually, I might not sell," um, but it was proven that she was because I think you know the 
the um, the adverts on Right Move um, and the estate agents popping around didn't help. I don't think. Really dated, uh, yeah. <laughs> but some advice to joining owners of is, is yeah, and to joining owners is um, you know if you are thinking of selling, then it's not very good to be vocal about that if if you're in a situation where there's damage. Um, so I think. So that obviously that's a unique circumstance, but I, so I think that reinstatement and diminution value is, is likely to hit calls yeah. at some point in the future. Um, now, now that everyone's aware of that argument, basically. Yeah. Uh, the next issue is, is piled perimeters, um, and the issue here really is verticality. So to to get access under the acts under a line of junction notice, you need to be building right up to the boundary, or or, or on the boundary. Um, but if you need to take account of the verticality of the piles, um, then it, it can be argued that if you're building right up to the boundary, then it's you know possibly 50-50 as to whether the piles are or aren't gonna um, gonna deviate onto the adjoining owner's land. I say 50-50 because I think you know a pile is always gonna go slightly out of line. It's it's probably unusual that they ever do go um, entirely plumb. Um, and so you can then set the piles back, but then if you set them back a certain distance, then I don't think you can argue that you're that it's a valid line of junction notice. Um, and, I, and I'm guessing the distance is about sort of 50 mil. If you're if you're further away than 50 mil, you're you're not you're not building on the on the line of junction. Um, so that in essence, that's the crux of the argument there. Um, the the risks involved with um, deviation of piles was explored in the case of Gravy Elite Town Management. And this was retrospective. This is where an adjoining owner um, dug down to the basement and found that the, the, the historically the building owners' piles had deviated into the uh, into the adjoining owners' land, and so they needed to trim. They needed to trim the piles. Um, so it, it, you know, it is a real risk. It, it, it certainly can happen. The other considerations um, with pole perimeters is um, is basically whether whether the actual piles themselves are, are a wall under the act. Um, which then you know, obtain access rights with them. So contiguous piles, secant piles, uh, diaphragm walls. Yeah, my my view is that they are walls. Um, if you, well, sorry, if you're creating, but if they're if they're there to create a basement, um, then my view is that they are they are walls because they're they're retaining walls. Um, but it does it is case specific. It depends on it depends on um, the structure above. It depends on the position of the pile cap. The um, the location uh, on the boundary, um, so really, the advice, the practical advice is that you really do need to look into the details to establish what the foundation is and and what the superstructure wall is to try and establish whether the whether the piles do or don't constitute foundations under the Act, walls under the Act, yeah. and that will dictate what access rights you have. So, so it's difficult to give advice without seeing you know the whole arrangement of the the. Yeah. The piles, the pile cap, and the and the superstructure, um, but it's just to obviously be aware um, of the issues surrounding um, access um, if it's right up to the boundary. The the other issue with with piles that we we see now on on the perimeter is, is screw piles. Screw piles tend to be being used now more and more often, um, and I've got a case at the moment where it's proposed that screw piles be used um, to underpin the party wall. Um, which brings up the, basically the screw piles go in, and then the the top of the screw piles are set within a uh, an underpin. So that raises the question: is the is the area where the screw piles project into the underpin, the mass concrete underpin, is that a special foundation? Um, my view is that it's it's not, but you can see that it's it, it could be questioned as to whether that is a, a special foundation or not. Um, the the lifespan of the screw piles it also comes into question. Because they, I believe, most screw piles are only designed to last around fifty years. Um, so if a building is to last longer, um, then yeah. then you know, then then the the lifespan of the um, of the, the design life of the screw pile comes into question. Um, so I think that's an issue we're going to see more and more now: is, is screw piles being used um, as as you know, as part of an underpinning process. Um, the next issue is inconvenience um, and unnecessary inconvenience. Section 7.1 of the Act forbids unnecessary inconvenience, but then 7.2, which is the section for compensation, um, 
basically suggests that you can that the compensation can be paid. So that implies to me that you can actually cause inconvenience. Um, so that there's 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 an overlap there. You know, you, you, there's an overlap between what you understand to be unnecessary inconvenience and what you understand to just be inconvenience. Because one is permitted, one is not. Um, and obviously, the the owners take extreme views. The the building owner will say, well, you know, I have the right to cause inconvenience. It's an enabling act, um, and therefore I, I can undertake these works. Whereas the adjoining owner will take the view, well, why should you cause me any inconvenience at all? Um, the, the cost always basically revolves around alternatives. Um, the, the building owner will not want to be put to any extra cost, whereas the adjoining owner will say, well, unless you undertake these works in a way that causes me the absolute least inconvenience possible, then by the very definition, it's unnecessary inconvenience. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we're talking, we, you know, we could be talking hundreds of thousands of pounds to say the works in a different way, just to, you know, just to limit the inconvenience slightly more. So, as always, it's 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 going to come down to reasonableness. Um, and the, the point to remember here is that the surveyors can't guide the design. That that came up in Gravy Le- 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 Town as well, um, where it was it was basically the the judge criticised um, the adjoining owner surveyor for trying to influence the design. So we can we can suggest that there's too much inconvenience, or even that we believe it's unnecessary inconvenience, but we shouldn't really be seen to be um, actually leading the design. Um, so as to sort of practical advice, as, as always, it comes down to making sure that the parties understand the positions. The extreme views are... I would imagine not going to be welcomed by the third surveyor, um, and they're not going to be welcomed by the judges. So, yeah, a balanced approach is is key. Um, that said, though, obviously the solicitors and the barristers will will very much entertain extreme views. Um, but yeah, as surveyors, we need to we're we're trying to resolve these disputes, so we need to we need to just be reasonable. Mm-hmm. Um, the next issue. Um, is it sort of follows on from the last, and it is how much damage risk is acceptable. So I think we all revert to the ground movement assessment, um, and we look at the um, the Syria guide um, or the BRE guide for cracking, um, and we look at the the amount of movement we sorry the amount of movement or cracking um, that we believe is is reasonable to risk to the adjoining owner's property. Um, and I think as long as it, as long as it is a a minor risk. Then you know, I believe it's 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 it's, it's likely to be acceptable. Um, no one's going to accept a risk that's going to cause you know large cracking. But if we're on the, the sort of the slight or very slight end of the scale um, of movement or, or or cracking, then I I think that's you know it's reasonable um, because otherwise you're you're going to prevent all all development. Um, the issue again comes down to the extreme views of the adjoining owner saying well. How is it possibly reasonable that you cause any damage whatsoever to my property? Um, and I think the answer to that is, if it was if it was definitely going to cause damage, if the works were definitely causing damage, then I don't think that is I don't think that is agreeable, um, and I don't think we have jurisdiction to award that. But if it is a risk, um, I think that is that is under our jurisdiction to say, well, that's it's an acceptable risk, and the act is there as a mechanism to. You know, to to give compensation if that risk is realised, and there is damage. Um, so again, it, it it just it always needs to be a reasonable view um, on these things, and it, and educating the owners um, that you know their extreme view is not what the act had in mind. What one issue that that I feel quite strongly about under this is um, when the joining owner surveyors request monitoring and security for expenses for damage. Because if you're if you're real time monitoring or if you're you know, the monitoring is quite intense, and so someone can go in immediately and, and arrest the movement if it's you know as soon as it's discovered, um, then potentially you're not going to have a situation where too much damage is going to be caused. So I think if you're requesting real time monitoring and also high security for expenses for damage costs, um, I don't think the two um, are there because they're in essence they're covering the same risks. Mm. I think that that needs to be considered. the The next issue is um, is two stage underpinning. Um, the reason why I raise this one is because I've got um, personal experience of 
uh, a two-stage underpinning process um, going um, horribly wrong, basically. Um, we were asked to come in on a job um, as, you know, replace the building owner surveyor um, where damage was caused in the, in the middle of some basement works. Um, and with the help of the, uh, well, sorry, with a lot of help of the engineer, we, we quickly worked out that what, what had happened was um, was that the, the, the ground at the bottom of the first phase underpin had not been tested um, to any great extent. Um, and so whilst the, whilst the formation level at the, at, the, at the bottom of the second stage underpin had been tested and it was known the ground was good at that level, um, the first stage, the, the soil wasn't very good. And so when the, when the first stages all went in, the party wall started to, started to drop. This also wasn't helped by the fact that spine walls and the rear wall had been removed, so the weight onto the party wall had been increased. Um, and then when we went in and undertook an inspection, we also found um, no evidence. Good, sorry, when we went in, the, the second phase had been completed, but we found that there was no evidence that the that there was a heel and a toe because we there was no there was no cutting off at the bottom of the first phase underpin, which you would see if if a um, if a if a toe had been cut off. We also asked for core holes to be drilled through at the bottom of the first phase to discover the thickness to see if there if there was a. Um, uh, if there was if there was a heel and toe, um, and, and we proved that there wasn't, so in essence that the contractor had taken a wall that was bearing onto um, you know the whole width of a, a full party wall brick corbelled footing, um, and reduced it to just the thickness of of the, of the party wall. So it it was inevitable that the wall was going to drop. The mistake that was made in in this job was that the uh, the adjoining owner surveyor, as soon as there was movement, asked for everything to everything to stop. Um, and actually got, on a, got um, a first of our determination that works must stop. Um, and uh, you know, our view was that that wasn't the best thing to do, um, because if the ground at the bottom of the first phase was unknown, um, it was better to complete the second phase at, you know, and, and, and basically um, get down to the level that, that was known to be good ground. Um, so that, that case is, is going on at the moment through the courts, um, and, uh, and so it should be should be quite an interesting one. Yeah. Um, but I think two-stage underpinning is used a lot um, and it, it does prevent, sorry, it does create more risk, I think, in, in, in certain circumstances. So it's, it's not always the right answer. I think it's, um, so some surveyors prefer it, but there are, there are risks involved. Mm. Um, and the, the last issue is the, is the implementation of the baby row. Um, I think where where um, where Judge Bailey um, gave his determination on this job, um, on sorry, this case, um, he did make the point that if he had felt that the um, that the mass concrete underpinning, the the, um, the Bailey rail, um, had not been needed um, in the interim um, or the or the final uh, design, um, that he would have awarded the case differently because if he if he thought it was there purely just to circumnavigate the act. Um, that, he, that he wouldn't have entertained it. So what the mistake that I see being made is where a design team um, doesn't include the Bailey Rail, um, and then if, if consent is then requested from the adjoining owner to give consent for special foundations, um, if it's refused, they then as a knee-jerk reaction go back to, the, you know, just install the mass concrete underpin. Um, so my view is that the, the process, the audit trail there shows that the mass concrete underpin is, is just not required and it, it purely is there because Special Foundations was um, was dissented. So my view is that what we should be doing um, is making sure that the, ba the Bailey Rail is in, in the original design, making sure that there is, that it serves a purpose and that it is needed. Um, and then if, if there is uh, an indication from the adjoining owner that they will give consent for special foundations, then you can look at the scheme and decide if it's worth removing that uh, that mass concrete underpin and doing it a different way. Um, but I think the other way is is, is fairly is fairly dangerous, um, and we could see cases on you know on the Bailey Rail going going to court again um, on the basis that the um, that the, the underpin was just put there purely just to set and navigate the act. So I think that, that that's the risk that I, I see on on um, on the use of the Bailey Rail because I don't think it's I don't think it's quite as simple as uh, as people first first thought. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's all the key points that I see. So, um, but... so yeah, so it looks like, you know, involving, um, so your involvement in basements, actually in general, for surveyors is going to be, it's going to become more and more litigious. No, it, it, it seems because it's going to be more and more complex. Um, and, and so you'll have less and less people really wanting to get involved in basements. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the amount, the amount of money that's involved in, in a basement project. So I think if you, if, if you've got a, um, a building owner that's got enough money to afford a basement, um, then if, if things do occur and they're not happy, they, they've probably also got enough money, um, for, for litigation. So the, the option of people to go to court over, over disputes over basements is obviously a lot, is a lot more, uh, likely. Um, the, I think the other thing with basements as well that, that I notice, and I'm sure a lot of others notice, is that people get very passionate about people digging massive noisy holes next, next to their property. So you'll, you'll find that with, you know, just a simple mention of someone doing a basement already sets emotions running, um, and people are already naturally just opposed to it. Um, and so it, you find this sort of domino effect of, um, you know, everyone being against basements, um, especially when the, the most common sort of complaint is that you can't live in a property that, that where there's a basement being built. So the, the building owner is off somewhere else, not having to put up with all the disruption, and the adjoining owners are obviously living next door to it. So that's the, you know, so it's always the common, the, the, the common complaint is that the, the building owner just doesn't care, um, you know, and, that, and they're not living there, so it's not there, you know, it's not they're not having to put up with the, with the inconvenience. Yeah. So emotions always tend to, to run high with basins, mm. which, uh, you know, is understandable. Yeah, and there's a lot of education to be done from your part, I imagine, on both parties to just make sure that it doesn't doesn't kick off. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, I, sorry. Sorry. Uh, we, yeah, we, I mean, we're here to resolve disputes ultimately, uh, and we should, and that's what we should remember. So, um, yeah, we're there to, to explain the situation to the parties. They, they might not like the situation. You know, joining owners might not like um, the extent of their rights, but um, ultimately, we're there to educate them on that um, and try and sort of steer them away from um, uh, you know disputes that are going to cost them a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. So maybe yeah, it's actually advising the building owner to um, to pay for the adjoining owner to go on holiday for for a year. <laughs> I have a, I've seen that situation once. Um, I think where the adjoining owner was so opposed to the basement that I think the building owner got some good advice and, and just thought it's probably going to be cheaper to send him on holiday for a year. <laughs> well, that's a great way to finish on this subject. Um, yeah, so Rob, thanks, thanks a lot. That was um, forty-three minutes, which is which is really good. Um, thanks for speeding through it. Um, sorry for interrupting every now and then. But, that's right. um, if uh, if people want to get in touch with you with questions and stuff, uh, do, do you do you respond to emails like that or? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my email address is is best. Okay, okay. They can find it on the on the Delver Patman uh, website. Um, yeah, what, what, if, if I send you my um, the slides, um, it's at the back of the slides, so okay. it would be as well. Perfect. Yeah, we'll make sure to include the slides then. Yeah. Okay. Thanks have a I, lot, I, Rob. Sorry. Have I sent you the slides? Um, yes, you have already. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, so, so thanks a lot. Them. And um, yeah, thanks again for your time. Thanks a lot. Cheers.